Pretty picture, eh? But in back of these hills, in the interior of this jungle, a Marine combat cameraman took some other pictures. On this combat slate, he describes them for you in his own plain words. Cape Gloucester, 7th Marines, leaving front. 23 days and nights in same clothes, fighting Japs, United States Marine Corps. These are American soldiers with war in their faces. French pilots fly American-built planes for the RAF. At 300 miles an hour, these A-20s skim over the waves of the English Channel toward the invasion coast, slipping into France at zero altitude, below the searching fingers of German detectors. Bellies scrape the cliffs, the fields, hedges, and houses on the way. No enemy fighter dares to dive at them. No ground battery has more than an outside chance to score a hit. They are on a great aerial steeplechase, and the prize of the hunt is a factory. smoke, the A-20s will return to their base in less than an hour. Three men in each of these American-built planes have dealt a blow to the enemy from the air that will save the lives of a hundred times their number when D-Day comes for our men on the ground. While the medium bombers are hedgehopping back to Britain, five miles above them an armada of our heavies battles its way deep into German skies. formation of forts and liberators struck another crippling blow at German fighter production. Only seven bombers failed to return. 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 And only 70 American boys failed to return. These boys in the twisted, burned, hollow shells of proud planes are now scattered over the sandy soil of Germany. These pieces of torn and smashed wreckage are mute testimony to the price we pay to destroy what lies beyond the frames of these pictures, the airplane factories of the enemy.
Methodically, German workers salvage this precious American metal, ship and stack it neatly. Every few cubic feet of this pile contains a plane, 22,000 hours of American labor. Every yard of it means 10 American boys dead or captured. This is a pile of American sweat and blood. But these terrible losses will not stop us. Give us the planes, and greater and greater fleets will go out in battle until not a factory in Germany is left to send one plane, one gun, one bullet against us. You build them, we'll fly them and keep them flying. That's what us boys out here in the Pacific say. We're bombing and strafing and dogfighting. Sometimes we don't come back all in one piece. But we'll get her flying again. It sounds so simple, but it isn't. Repair and maintenance of a plane requires precision machinery, Precision tools, precision instruments. Out here in New Guinea, it requires something else besides. A lot of ingenuity. For over a year now, the men at this New Guinea Air Depot have done every type of job from overhauling B-17s to rebuilding obsolete P-39s. How did they do it? Well, stripping disabled planes, they salvaged wire and instruments and pipes and screws and bolts. Out of the wooden crates, they built tables and workbenches and cabinets. They took an old prop shaft and made it into a conductor for this cadmium plating plant. They welded their own tank. All this equipment was designed at Port Moresby and built out of salvaged parts. The oil temperature regulator, the hydraulic testing device for struts, the carburetor repair unit. Here is their instrument shop, completely dustproof and air-conditioned. Their refrigerator unit was salvaged from an abandoned ice plant in Australia. At one end of the base, men cut and stitch and sew canvas for various sections of planes from turbo supercharger covers to patches on landing gear doors. At the other end, they repair wing sections, weld engine mounts, refinish plexiglass. The lathes and hand tools come from America. But when factory equipment fails to arrive, they build their own, and sometimes it's better than the standard ones. They forge precision tools. Look at the Sperry screwdriver. The one developed at Port Moresby can be operated with one hand, and it has a collar to prevent the bit from slipping off the screw. Outside, mechanics work on the wings, engines, fuselage. Here is a new type of wing jack. A special collar fits under the boom to prevent it from slipping. The jack is mounted on wheels with a cement base. Here's a portable engine hoist, model M1944. The M stands for Moresby. During the last year, American workers in uniform have put an average of 500 planes a month back into the air. They have salvaged the work of hundreds of thousands of American man-hours spent on the home front. They have maintained and repaired over 30 different types of aircraft and many thousand different parts in each of them. You build them, and we'll keep them flying. does a bullet travel before it hits a chap? 150 yards? Uh-uh. A little bit further. The bullet starts to travel here, back home in the mines and the mills, when the parts of the unmade bullet begin their journey to the factory. Total distance to the factory, 11,700 miles. Finished bullet shoves off for California. 3,000 miles more. 
across the Pacific to Australia. Add another 6,700 miles. Then, 2,100 miles by air, by truck, by mule, and up to the front on the back of a man. And this is where we came in. Range, 150 yards, plus 23,500 miles. This is Naples. At dawn from staging areas near this ancient Italian port, American supplies start moving out. Destination, secret. Mission, secret. Gathered and waiting in the harbor is the invasion fleet. Its officers have their sealed orders. This is the beginning of what turned out to be one of the boldest and toughest combined operations fought by the 5th Army on the blood-soaked Italian boot. On this mission are battle-hardened veterans of our North African and Sicilian campaigns. This is the beginning of the surprise American landing behind the backs of the Germans at a small seaside town a few miles south of Rome. Name of the town, Anzio. Out to sea now, our men have been told the nature of the job ahead of them. They know that they are moving in for battle with Nazi first-line troops, trained, hard-seasoned veterans who have the strength and determination to stand up against us. Our secret was well kept. The German garrison is caught completely off guard when we reach Anzio Harbor at 2 a.m. For six hours, we land men and equipment. Then comes this. raids we keep unloading. The quicker we can get the heavy stuff ashore, the better our chances are of staying ashore. Simply landing is not enough, even with strong fighting equipment. Invasion means occupation. Occupation means driving the enemy off, keeping him from driving us off. But some of the stuff we started out with will never be used. For instance, this cargo. And this. And these ships. We save whatever we can and march into Anzio. Take Anzio. We and our British allies seize Natuno two miles down the coast. And all the while, the Nazi planes keep pasting us. we keep pasting back. ME-109 taking its last dive. That direct hit on us, and 
and others like it, set these heavy trucks flaming in the narrow streets of Anzio, 5,000 miles from their home factories. Precious tires going up in smoke. Look at this duck, set afire, being towed out of a congested supply area to keep its flames from spreading to other materiel. And this is all that's left of another one of our trucks. Our aim is to pinch off the vital German supply route between Rome and Casino. We widen and deepen our beachhead to approximately 100 square miles. But it is a beachhead as flat and exposed as an arena. Nazi long-range guns keep pounding it, and beyond to the harbor where our ships are supplying us with food and ammunition. It is a beachhead where a general is as vulnerable as a private and vice versa. 100 square miles with not a single square inch of safety. We sent those tanks out there as decoys to draw enemy fire so that our spotters can locate the exact position of German gun emplacements. locate the Nazi guns and let them have it. And don't spare the ammunition. They bury teller mines to slow our push. Our engineers dig them out. Reduce them to dead iron instead of dead Americans. We find them using this vicious new type of wood and plastic mine called the wooden shoe, which evades detection by our minesweepers. It contains enough TNT to tear off a soldier's foot. We clean the field and advance. Up to the time these scenes were taken, we were slowly gaining ground. But these Nazi supermen whom we captured still boasted that they would roll us back into the sea. Wounded American boys being treated in the field. A rifle stock makes an emergency splint. Frontline surgery. Not a pretty sight, but this is the stern reality. This is the inevitable cost of war. The cost of fighting and destroying an army as technically powerful, as totally equipped for global murder as the Nazis. The importance that Hitler placed on the Anzio Casino line, on his determination to make it hold, was evidenced by the fact that he threw in much of the pick of his elite divisions. The Hermann Goering, the Reichsführer Brigade, the Panzers. Yes, the Germans have only one last hope, to make our victory so costly that we will weaken, compromise, make a deal with them and their Axis pals. But in the name of these heroic wounded, we at home pledge ourselves not only to continue producing the material for victory, but pledge our united determination to make that victory final, complete, Total.